I'm probably uh, looking at stuff that I haven't seen for a while, which is actually the impetus or the, the reason I, I, I kind of wanted to do it in the first place. My wife says that I'm my brand name, as it were, is, is like more Gilbert, New Yorker cartoonist. But the stuff that I've done in the New Yorker and all the other magazines uh, all of these years is only really one small percentage of the stuff that I've done. So this has afforded me an opportunity. Well, it began with the exhibition at the New York Historical Society. Afforded me an opportunity of finally getting out of the, the closet, or in fact, the archives of that locker downtown Manhattan that's stored all this stuff for years into the open. And let people say, I see it, that I've been doing really a, a lot of other stuff. Then one thing led to another, and I thought, well, we should have a book to go along with it. And I, I got in touch mm. with, uh, with Gary. And uh, we said, yeah, well, we'll do a small companion book or a catalog. That's what I was thinking. When I started digging through stuff and digging through stuff, and it's got to be hundreds and thousands of things. So then the pages started to mount, and it became, instead of a 16-page booklet, I think it's it's 112 pages now. And it's we were still having difficulty closing the trunk, you know, throwing things out. And uh, so there's a lot of stuff here. But I think it's fairly representative of, like, of, of all of the other, other things that I did. And I'm sort of grateful, you know, to Gary and everybody else there putting it together. Seems like you hold on to everything. There's drawings from when you were a child. This, this goes pretty far back. Yeah, uh, Lincoln's time, I think it was. Yeah, <laughs> Abe and I were friendly at school. Uh, I taught him to draw on a shovel. No, uh, I guess I thank my mother for that. She always saved everything. You know, I was the darling firstborn of the firstborn of the firstborn. So when I started making scribbles, you know, everything was saved. There is a folder, uh, an envelope downtown in that infamous locker down on Van Damme Street that has... Uh, probably all of the, the greeting cards and the happy birthday cards from my birth. You know, so these are birthday cards. And uh, I think the record shows that I'm 87 years old. So those cards are, are very, very old. And so my mother was probably saving all those drawings. And I guess I got into the habit of, of, of doing that uh, as well myself. So yeah, there's, there's stuff down there that I haven't even seen. I know it's there and uh, it's there. But it's fun looking at at that first uh, drawing, I've had one uh, from the my Hebrew school book. It's in the, the covers of my Hebrew school book when I was sort of idly, instead of conjugating verbs, mm. uh, I was uh, drawing Batman beating up bad guys. And so that was what it was. You've been drawing comics in some form or another your entire life. Well, uh, a comics has a very specific reference. I've been drawing cartoons and, and the subheads for a lot of years, yeah. Uh, I just started doodling then, I guess it was, when I was about six or seven or eight, nine. And I just really never stopped doing it one form or another. I mean, it took me a long time to decide not to stay in a nine-to-five uh, routine and to go freelance. I didn't start doing any kind of freelance till I was about, th I mean, seriously, until I was 31. Mm -hmm. I had had previous jobs and things like that. But it was always always something to do with drawing and noodling and writing and whatever. What stopped you in those early days from pursuing this full time? Well, uh, very specifically, it was it was not a chosen field uh, as far as my family was concerned. Uh, I went to CCNY City College Baruch uh, because I was because it was free and that was an education, a college education that I would not have been able to go anyplace else because there was no money to go to school. While I had shown and expressed an interest in, in drawing and being a, maybe being a cartoonist, I was discouraged from that. I mean, my uncles, my parents, my father had never really earned any more than $45 a week as a, you know, a cutter in a, a shower curtain factory. So, um, it was not the kind of thing I was supposed to go into. Uh, middle class or lower middle class Jewish family, and I just follow along. I should be a doctor or a lawyer or any of those things. But I, I had no interest whatsoever in, in doing that. What really stopped me from doing that kind of stuff uh, was that I didn't like it. And all I liked to do it was yeah. my own things. But at the same time, I got no encouragement to do that and actually was steered into this business <clears throat> degree. I got a degree at BBA, a Bachelor of Business Administration. Uh, at CCNY, but the only thing I really got out of that book was an opportunity to draw s cartoons for the school paper, and that's, you know. What changed? Why did you decide that this was something that you were actually going to pursue? Well, I was, I, you know, I went into the, into the 
direction of becoming a, a business person. Uh, the idea was to go to City College and go into advertising, and then I would be able to practice my creative tendencies of writing and drawing things and making stuff up. And then I that got into a, a stop. Uh, when I went into the Army, I was drafted. I wound up in Alaska and uh, pushed to build. I thought I was not really cut out to be running around in sub-zero temperatures in uh, Alaska. Uh, I got to be editor of the Post newspaper, so I was writing and drawing and writing and drawing and writing and drawing. I came back and I started, I got a couple of jobs. Uh, newspaper reporter I thought was good. Uh, that was about a year. And then I got into a couple of sales promotion jobs. One was at Cosmopolitan Magazine. Again, doing the creative stuff, but it wasn't mine, and I didn't really love it. And then a hunter got me to uh, Ziff Davis, where I was in charge of 18 magazines. And that was really, you know, sort of the end. I couldn't stand it. I really didn't like, A, being told what to do or asked what to do. Uh, and B, the subject material was all those very specialized magazines, mm-hmm. the Electronics World, Hi-Fi Review, and I really didn't care about it. And uh, I just finally said, I just can't do this anymore. And all the time I thought, well, maybe I'll just must try it somehow. I mean, in point of fact, I got very angry, very angry one day at my boss for changing my copy. And I said, I got to quit. I mean, it was somewhat more dramatic, but passing it on, the main thing was I quit the job and I, I had saved about $500 or so. I had a car. I drove to Mexico because it was uh, cheap. And uh, I stayed there for about a year and change, uh, going around teaching myself to draw and uh, met some people and decided I'd give it a shot. I sent something back to Esquire magazine. They bought it. And I said, oh, well, I can do this. I came back to New York and then just started walking around and my uh, making rounds and trying things out and saying, well, maybe I can try this, maybe try to, and if it doesn't work, I'll go back and get a job. Is Mexico a good place to learn how to draw? Well, I I never went to art school and I was just teaching myself. I had yeah. pencils and papers. I had I spoke a little Spanish and uh, I went to a tiny town that had never been heard of in this country before, uh, which then became known as San Miguel de Allende, where everybody goes now. So it was the whole thing. And I just stayed by myself. That's was the main thing. I didn't want any other distractions. I lived on top of a mountain, and I drew filled sketchbooks. Like a monk, you lived on top of a mountain in Mexico? Well, uh, I wasn't exactly a monk, <laughs> you know, but I said I had a car, and I threw a, a whole series of interesting, you know, happenstances. I managed to get a house, to live in a house on top of the hill that had been owned, was owned by somebody else. I didn't have to pay rent. And the family, there was a Mexican family that lived there, and they would take care of me. So that was it. And uh, it was it was good for me to be on top of the mountain because then it didn't it, it didn't provide me any any impetus to go and hang out with, with all the expatriates who were down in the town, you know, drinking themselves silly. Uh, and so I was fairly able to uh, accomplish it. I drove around a lot, and you know, obviously took in a lot of the Mexican uh, countryside and the people, and yeah, that was fun. Even at that point, New York was a difficult to, place to live on a freelance artist's salary. Um, well, when I came back, that was about 61, and I started selling cartoons. Certainly, it, it was it was a challenge, but of course, the cost of living was one twelfth of what it was, yeah. what it is today. So, I mean, I was able to start selling, and in my test appearances, my test trials, I'd be selling cartoons to magazine was paying me ten dollars for a cartoon. But there were a lot of magazines. Yeah. And I could live for a year in Mexico at six thousand dollars, seven thousand dollars. When I came back I, I moved back with my family, uh, in Brooklyn and um I guess after about eight months I saw that I was, you know, making a couple of bucks and I, I managed to get an apartment down in the village. It was a uh, professional apartment as they call it. Yeah. But I would think I was paying $55 a month. So, I mean, a freelance artist is always going to be a difficult life in any case. But I think I was able, and many of my colleagues and my compatriots at that time uh, were able to do the same thing. So while they were only paying $10 or $15, $25, there were about 50 magazines I could go around and sell to. 
And so after a couple of years, you know, I started going up the ladder, selling the higher priced magazines, uh, Saturday Review and, and True. And, and finally, I got to the Saturday Post. Uh, and that was a big deal. And Look and, and, and uh, Women's Home Companion. And then I started to sell Playboy. And then finally got to the New Yorker. I mean, actually, it, was, it took about four years, or three or four years. But at that point, you know, the prices went up. And uh, I guess so did my income, as it were. Uh, but again, it was at the time that I started doing a lot of experimental stuff, which most of the time was not really seen a lot, but I liked to do it, like the reportage, like the spreads, children's books, the illustrations. Uh, I see yesterday uh, in the paper today, Russell Baker died. It was a guy. I used to do a lot of spots for the uh, New York Times, and very often I would uh, illustrate uh, one of his columns. He was a wonderful guy. It started to expand that way. So... Sure, it was a very tough thing economically, and actually still is, you know, in its way, because uh, nobody really needs uh, cartoons or f funny writing. What they need is uh, implants or, what was it, 35 lawyers that uh, Trump says that he, everybody has to have in his life? Stylistically, there are certainly differences from piece to piece. Reagan Land, for example, looks a little bit more like a, a children's book, but you did settle on a primary style, or at least there's sort of like one that, that people associate with you. How long did it take to develop that? I didn't develop it. It just happened. <clears throat> like Topsy, it grew. I, as I said, I never had any uh, art school. I never yeah. went to so whatever I, whatever I was doing, I just sort of like did it on my own, and it was kind of sketchy. And I think uh, I wouldn't even know about how to describe what my uh, style is. Ann Telness did a, a beautiful thing uh, in the introduction. I mean, she calls it a easy to do, a line, some kind of a, a line that I've used, a drawing line. So, I mean, what I'm, I'm trying to say is that it was very, it was simply a, what came out. In other words, I didn't try to do anything. I didn't try to emulate anybody else's style. I certainly was aware of uh, the way people w were drawing. I mean, I think some of my friends uh, were just a masterful line. I mean, Jules Pfeiffer, of course, is, <laughs> he has that kind of like line that just goes dashing all over the place. And I draw directly. Unlike what had been taught earlier in the art schools where you, you first put down a very careful underlaying soft pencil and then you trace over it with a number two uh, brush that's a very good line and things like that. I just would grab the pencil or the pen or the, well, not such, I never drew with a brush, but different kinds of chalks and things. And I just drew directly. And I think that probably arose out of the early uh, sketches I, that I just would do stuff on the subway and, uh, uh, then later on, when I was doing the actual reportage stuff, which was in the on-the-spot recording and reporting, I witnessed those spreads in the Democratic National Convention and the stuff I went to, the Nick games, the belly dancers stuff. This is all on the spot in London, you know, wherever I, I went, and it was a direct drawing with the pen, and that was you know, the way I, I drew. I think that carried over a lot into the cartoons that I did uh, a lot in all of the magazines. And so if that was the way it developed, I think it was there at the very beginning and I didn't, didn't change it. I often think that I should have gone to school to learn how to draw, but they said, well, you got this far, you know, yeah. you stick with it. Do you think there were any benefits to not having had a formal arts education? Well, I think so, but my wife thinks it's really ridiculous to think about that. I always make a joke about the fact that I think I was about 26 or 27 years old when I finally learned that there was a a school in New York City called uh, the High School for Music and Arts. I mean, I didn't even know it existed. You know, later on, I found out that people like Harvey Kurtzman and Al Jaffe and all these guys and Ed Fisher, they had gone to Music and Art High School. And yeah. I said, gee, if I hadn't gone there, I might have made something for myself. <laughs> so, you did okay uh, for yourself, I think. Uh, well, the, the irony is that I wound up, uh, you know, years later, uh, after establishing some part, I wound up teaching cartooning and three drawing classes at Parsons School of Design. Yeah. So 17 years, you know, but it was just simply sharing information that I had between myself and interviewing a lot of the really, really great ones like Frank Modell and Charles Adams and uh, all mm -hmm. those people that, that are in that book, Cartooning the Art and the Business, which I got a reward for. But anyway, there's always a sense of jealousy among artists. People who ought, do have that fine arts trading, I think they often are jealous of people whose work looks effortless. Obviously, Jules Pfeiffer is somebody who, who really worked to develop that style, but 
it just looks like something that kind of flows from his pen. And I think you have a similar quality to your work. Well, thank you. Uh, effortless was the word I was looking yeah. for. That's the line that Anne used uh, to describe it, effortless line. It makes it look easy. It looks easy, but it's not, you know, to do. But again, I, I don't think of it as being difficult to do. And I've seen Jules' work. I mean, you know, it just does come out. Or Ed Sorrell. I mean, he's a master. I mean, a lot of these people are just, they're really great. And I, I think the only one who worked at it a little bit, but also I think was very loose, was uh, uh, Chuck Saxon, great uh, New Yorker cartoonist. Uh, he would do things with overlays, and uh, he did very, he, he did a drawing that he would take a very, very light <clears throat> weight bond paper. He wouldn't be actually tracing over his drawing. He would be drawing loosely over it. But in terms of uh, of laying things out better and maybe moving stuff around, so it was a combination then of being calculated and also you know that spontaneous. Uh, but I would be doing these roughs. Uh, I'm sure as Jules would as well. And if it didn't look good uh, right away, I'd just throw the paper away and start over again. So you'd have a lot of papers going. Frank Modell was like that too, one after another, just fabulous. He was one of the best. You scrap a lot of stuff. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, there's no point, unless, I mean, I, I can go, you know, if I'm doing a drawing and I'm getting just to the end of it and I mess up a little bit, it's okay mm -hmm. because I'll use that old uh, time-honored practice of, uh, of patching. I mean, at least I don't like that nose, and I just take a piece of paper and I go and draw another nose, mm -hmm. cut it out and paste it on. Bob Blackman is a master of this. George Booth does this. And they're all filled with like pieces of adhesive tape, you know, on, on top of it. But what happens is that you, you maintain the spontaneity of it. As soon as you, you know, you can see it. You know, I can see it. If you're doing it this very slow, careful thing, it's, it's, it's a little tight. Actually, I notice it, you know, I've had this little eye thing for a, about six months now. Or I seven. should mention that you're wearing an eye patch right now for the I'm listener at home. Yeah, everybody can see that, right? <laughs> they can hear it in your voice. <laughs> can see it in my blood. But my, I'm just aware now that because I'm only really using one eye to draw with, and I'm, you know, trying to do this, I'm not as confident and as loose, and I'm tending to be a little, a little tighter. It's, I want to sort of see where I'm going. But prior to this, I, I wouldn't be paying attention to where I was going, and that's you can always look back afterwards. I said as I said, and make a correction of uh, what the drawing looks like. But it's the same thing also in, in, in writing. You know, a lot of the stuff, for example, what I'm seeing in the book, of course, is a lot of writing that I've done that compares with this. And it's, just, it's a similar thing as, you know, everybody has always said, writing is, well, good writing is only rewriting. For a lot of the introductions in this, this book, uh, like uh, Conrad, with the editor, would say, well, we, you, we need 150 words for that. So I would sit down, and before I could take three breaths, I had 600 words. So uh, you have to keep those, and then, you know, the nutty part of it, and just cut them back down again. Has teaching made you a better artist? Well, I haven't taught for a long time, but, but when I was teaching, I would be inviting my friends, uh, the real super cartoonists to come and be guests and that also <clears throat> in teaching others I would be looking for others models to uh, show the students the different techniques in ways so in a sense of looking at things that certainly would inform me and I would be you know better you know knowledge I mean Ed Sorrell would always make jokes you know you'll be all right more once you learn to draw hands better he would say <laughs> we had a lot of jokes about that and so I, I fo focused on hands you know yeah. a little bit more so I would say yes but again I it's perhaps embarrassing for me to say that to say this but I really haven't s studied any others to try to make me better I, I am what I am and that's uh, like to improve and that's going to be the part where I'll go back over a drawing or something or being more conscious but I think still it's, it's the best and I feel when I used to do all of those on the spot things the less conscious I was of what I was trying to do and how I was doing it the better those drawings would come out those things I look like, like I did in London or sketches that I went out with uh, a medical team in India. And it was just a couple of hours of being all the Nick games, you know, that was, I was out of my mind. I was rooting for the Knicks, you know, so I wasn't paying attention to the drawings. I was transferring mm. <clears throat> the emotions that was going on in the garden. 
uh, from them through the pen uh, onto the papers. Do you feel, though, that your style continues to evolve? I n- never f- entertained that question in my mind. Sure. This book, the Fanographics book, is is a good opportunity to sort of go back and look at how it's changed over the oh, years. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think, uh, actually, it's not sort of a joke. I can look at all of these drawings that are in the book, and anybody else who look at the drawings would be another clue to my so-called development is, is how I was so, on the earliest drawings, even we start from the ones that showed up from high school and through college and then to the early appearances in magazines, uh, I seem to be more concerned with what my signature looked like than anything else. So it's very quote-unquote, artfully formed when I was, uh, you know, at Lafayette High School. And by the time it... uh, you know, the most recent drawings I was doing, this, it becomes illegible. You know, you can't, you'd never know my name by the way I'm signing it right now. I think in the same way, those early drawings are, are more self-consciously done. Mm. Uh, you can you can see the drawings in yourself, sure, absolutely. And uh, there's a lot more lines, there's more care, there's more consciousness about putting stuff down uh, than the more recent drawings. And I think, yeah, you're right. You can see how that, you know, develops. But again, it wasn't anything that I had said to myself, gee, you know, I I better draw more effortlessly. Yeah. <laughs> there's the case of a basketball game where when you're there and literally there's something else going on that you're focusing on. But when it comes to just sitting down and working on something for the New Yorker Playboy, how do you get out of your own head? How do you not focus too much on perfecting the work? I think what I'm doing, of course, is the most most important thing in drawing cartoons is getting the characters right, the expressions of the people, both in terms of the body language and their the emotions, what they're feeling in the situation. I mean, if I, I'm dreaming up these situations. And so I guess, you know, that's the part of being an actor. And as I have said, you know, for years in teaching and in the book, a cartoonist is, is really a sum total of, of every kind of creative form. He's an actor, he's a director, he's a script writer and everything else. And so when you're sitting there in those minutes and you're coming up with an idea and you got the idea, or at least, you know, I have an idea, when I get around to thought, I'm going to kind of draw this, I guess I'm just going into a, a performance mode, and I'm trying to maybe imagine what it feels like. And I've been told that I sit there, and if you watch me, you know, my my own face, you know, gets into those uh, expressions that I want to uh, do. I guess it, it's just, uh, so maybe it's a kind of a visualization. Uh, mm. I don't know. It's it's hard hard to say, but I'm not, again, I'm not conscious of constructing something except in the way of telling the story inside that one panel or in three panels or whatever it is, which is, you know, setting up a situation, getting people to know what's going on and then coming uh, to a punchline, you know, going through a composition and a drawing. It seems to me that it would be difficult to, especially with comedy, get a joke across in one panel versus three wherein you don't have any sort of setup or, or context you have to deliver everything to someone all at once it is a challenge and there are people who find jules has never really been comfortable doing mm. single panel stuff yeah. and we yeah the village voice was three or four panels I yeah think. but in terms of and actually i did a an introduction to a book with uh, with Ed Fisher, another really great uh, artist, uh, the art and cartooning, when we were actually making comparisons to uh, works of art. And in a single panel cartoon, uh, it's kind of comparable to a um, stand-up comic building and telling a joke. But you do it visually. You try to, through a lot of visual methods, get the person to look at something on the left-hand side, uh, of the page, and then direct the eye moving through the panel until it gets to the right-hand mm. side, left to right, because we read in English. I mean, if you do it in Hebrew, it's going to be the other way around. But when you get to that visual part, it's usually going to wind up at the end of the, uh, I mean, on the right side of the page. And similarly, when you're writing a caption, you, you want to keep it short, and you want to get that last funny part in the last couple of words. So you're setting it up, you're telling the story, and it comes to the end. A man walked into a house and he said, da, 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 and bang. And so that's how the one panel kind of works tonight, more or less. 
It sounds like the comedy part came relatively easy versus the drawing. The drawing was something you had to work on, but the jokes were already there. Well, I don't. I never thought that I did jokes. Again, uh, this is something that I don't think that you can really uh, teach. Uh, it's an observational and a reactive kind of thing uh, in general. Uh, I actually verbalized this at some point doing a, a talk up in uh, New England, uh, one of those islands, Nantucket, I guess, <laughs> and because uh, we were eating a lot of seafood, and I was making uh, a speech and making some kind of a, maybe an answer to something like you just said, what, what the cartoon is getting ideas, which is what you're saying, or something is funny. And I, I said, a cartoonist is really very much like an oyster, because uh, an oyster, you know, swims around, and, and uh, at some point, something like a grain of sand gets inside the shell and irritates the oyster. And in reaction, the oyster produces a pearl. Cartoonists are people who walk around, and they, here's the life, and they're swimming around, and something, it's a car horn, and something, whatever it is, becomes an irritant, or at least gets their attention, gets under their skin. And out comes a cartoon. So the secret of being a good cartoonist is being annoyed. Well, for me it is. I mean, a lot of stuff that bothers me, one sense or another, or I'll make a comment about it. It's just that I react to things. And that's exactly the same way, in one form or another, that all cartoonists do, or writers do, or reporters. The difference between us, probably, is uh, is that we put our things down on paper, or Comics do it, you know, verbally, or the, the late night host. It's a reactive to material that's that's out there. Even even the people are not not doing the the contemporary stuff. They're looking at something that uh, inspires them, and then because what cartoons are doing uh, are twisting cliches, or cliches being very uh, familiar inputs, and if you're just turning around, a lot of it is different, and it only takes a slight twist. When I'm able to do that, well, those are my the cartoons that I really favor. I really love the most the Gore Bush uh, recounts. All mm-hmm. of that was going on, and I I knew I wanted to get a, a special something. I had to make. I hadn't done anything about that, and I was uh, riding on the subway down to the New Yorker on normal routine. And on the subway, I suddenly, you know, all that material that had been churning around in my head formed. And I came up with this situation where this little kid is at dinner with his parents. And uh, he looks up and he says, today in school, we learn how to recount to 10. So that's a slight twist. Instead of count to 10, everybody would think it's the recount that was worth. So it's a tiny little twist. Uh, that's a, or a classic of mine. I once did, well, not, not a contemporary thing. It's a slave ship. And here's a slave driver who's going through all of these slaves who are rowing on the boat. And he's holding a pad making notes and talking to this one slave who's particularly haggard and who looks up at him and says, when do I want my vacation? Well, how about the first two hours in August? So now I'm just changing one word. Yeah. That's, I don't want to say that's that's the routine because it's a lot of different forms. There are a couple of Trump era gags in, in the new book. And I think this relates back to that. They're not Trump as a character. It's more of the way in which people are reacting to him or the way it's filtering down into day-to-day life. Like a good example is two women at a party and one woman is going to introduce her boyfriend and realizes that, you know, he's wearing a Trump button and she's wearing a Hillary button. So it's n- maybe not as much a direct comment on Hillary and, and Trump as it is the impact that they have on normal everyday people. Well, yeah, sure. Uh, in that group also, there's uh, there's a one of the party where uh, the, this guy is coming on to the girl or woman. Say and says, how about we go back to my place and not talk about Trump? Mm-hmm. So there is the awareness of that and how it's all reflective and bouncing off things that happen and look at the, looking at them in different ways. One of the comments that I've heard from some comedians during the Trump era is that he's, as a figure, is so ridiculous that he's hard to satirize because he's almost beyond satire. Absolutely, um, which goes back to the early beginnings for me, which is in The Realist, which probably people don't even know about it anymore, but Paul Krasner, yeah. who was a leader of a good friend, and I still talk to him and still quote him on one of his favorite things was you can't make this stuff up because even back then there were headlines that were occurring in the New York Times that was so unbelievable that was beyond satire and it is true 
uh, Trump is beyond satire. There's nothing that we can say that makes him more incredible than, than he is. I've been trying to do a lot of things also for the, the New Yorker now on its website to the daily uh, cartoon. And the news changes so quickly, mm. you know, and he does things so, so outrageously that it, it truly is, you know, beyond our reach in terms of making stuff up. I did a, I did one, uh, early one uh when he was appointing all of these uh nominate nominating all these people for these uh posts and uh their qualifications you know obviously were not terrible and there was this one where he the senate committee is sitting at the table awaiting the next person and a fox is walking in you know waiting to be interviewed and one of the committee members turns to the other one and says uh the the nominee for Secretary of Chicken Coops. Well, that's the best I could do, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. in that sense. Uh, but it turned out to be a very popular thing because Gloria Steinem used it in a speech, uh, the same phrase. So that was kind of like funny. But it is true. And, and trying to do these things every day, and we're now into two years of this. I mean, it's just exhausting because there's nothing more uh, that can really be said, almost, that is, uh, has not been said or done. Well, you've lived through a lot and you've, you've cartooned a, a, about a lot. And obviously, a lot of things in history tend to be cyclical. But does this moment feel different than what you've lived through? In a way, um, yes. And in a way, no. And that's the, the sad part of it. In the book, uh, the you know this, this Fantagraphics book, the uh, Mort Gerberg on the scene, uh, I use a lot of material of particular movements. Uh, one was the women's movement, mm -hmm. which was uh, which I, I used in uh, Ride On Sister, which is a book in the early seventies. Another one was uh, the High Society, or what happened when the country finally went to pot, and Reagan World, the amusement park for all the right people. The scary thing about those books is that they were so prescient; they really, really predicted uncannily all of the things that are now being replayed today this is 40 years 30 40 years later which is why i've re reprinted those books and they'll be out and available now too it is really the same but it is different but it is the same and that's the the, the cruel part about it i mean particularly in this uh, equal rights amendment which i just mentioned you know because it's, they're still looking for another another uh uh, uh vote to confirm it all of these years later and all these women's marches i mean i marched in the 60s you know and uh we're still marching so it's the same but it's not the same but it is the same is that discouraging well it's discouraging for one in one sense but at the same time uh the cartoons that i did then <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, they have as much yeah. strength today as they did then. You don't expect that when you're writing about something top. Oh my God, no, no. You think that's really going to be of the moment, but it it certainly does does replay. What keeps you drawing? That's what I do. It's what I do. I think it's with everybody who's a cartoonist or a writer or anything else. Mm -hmm. You get up in the morning and and you're reacting to something, and uh, you know instead of you know, hollering and screaming and pissing and moaning about it, which I do anyway. Yeah. At least I have something, you know, to put it down upon or make fun of it or laugh at it or whatever it is, but it's just like doing. When I was doing the, 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 the cartooning book, Cartooning the Art and the Business, it was made up a lot of, uh, from interviews with my colleagues and friends at the time. There were two questions that are, people were always asking cartoonists. One is, <clears throat> what kind of a pen do you draw with? Mm -hmm. You know, meaning that if you knew what kind of a pen you could use the pen and yeah. you'd get the same results. Yeah. And then the second question is always, you know, uh, where do you get your ideas from? Which, of course, if you knew that, you know, then mm -hmm. you don't have that. And, if you, of course, if we knew, well, we would always do ideas. And I remember going up and talking to Charles Adams, whom I was some acquainted with. Charlie, as I said, everybody asks about this. So I have to ask you a question, too. Where, where do you get your ideas from? How do you get your ideas? Charlie was very funny, droll, and he probably been asked this question a long time, and he, he stood down and looked down at me and said, Well, Mort, he says, I don't really know. I'm, I'm really kind of like a, a cow. I just give milk. See? I thought, well, that's as good an answer yeah. as everything else. And so why or how or... To keep doing what we're doing, it's simply what we do. That's that's all there is to it. It's kind of an X factor. I mean, if anybody, and I've often said this in 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 writing, and of course in in the classes too, anybody who willfully goes into a 
occupation, as it were, or a, a line of activity where statistically, at least it was always the case as a New Yorker, 98% of the work that you do is rejected. Mm. I mean, you got to be crazy to do this. I mean, uh, I think there are very few people who really, whom I know, who really make a living just doing nothing but this. So they've always had to have something else on the side. So again, that might have been a motivation for me, not being known primarily as a single panel magazine cartoonist, to try other things. So I've done the comic strips, I've done the children's books, I've done reporting, I've done whatever I can, not only because I, I like to do it, to explore these other forms, but because uh, it could possibly afford me, uh, you know, another possible means of, uh, of income, which is always, a, you know, a consideration. Yeah, I mean, you brought it up, you know, mm -hmm. earlier. You yeah. Know? yeah, I've been in New York for 15 years now, and it has not been <laughs> it's not been easy. It's a hard place to explore your dreams, ironically. <laughs> well, on the one hand, it provides a lot of opportunities yeah. to try things uh, that were silly. That's one thing. But on the other hand, it's, uh, you know, it, it, it's tough to make a, a living. Yeah. I mean, I came up with ideas of doing cartoons on television. So for years, a couple of years, I was on NBC and I did I did uh, News of the Week in Review. And uh, I had a minute and 30 seconds. This is my own idea to sit in front of a camera alive and to draw make a drawing of a cartoon and talk about it at the same time boy this is a terrific thing so it was on for a while i didn't make any money from yeah. it i thought oh i'm going to be on television it'll be really great i did the nixon inauguration i mean all of these things that i made them up and yeah it was a great place because nobody i try it I mean, going to Chicago is my idea. I got an, uh, an assignment from the Saturday Review. I took a sketchbook. I went to Chicago for three days, got beaten up and everything else. But I didn't need money. I mean, I got paid for the, the thing. It's not a place where you get rich and famous. Yeah. You haven't uh, considered retiring at any point? There's no, no, I, there's nothing to retire from. If, you, if this is what you do, I did a book a couple of years ago. I was eight years ago. Uh, did a collection of cartoons. The title of the book was Last Laughs, cartoons about aging, retirement, and the great beyond. And I invited 25 colleagues you know, from the New Yorker and else place to do their cartoons. And I wrote a, an introduction to the book. And the retirement, you see, in the old age part, it's just it's not there. It just doesn't happen because this, this is what you like to do. It's, it's fine. I mean, look at Jules. Jules is over 90 or 91 now. He and Cyril are about the same age. I mean, he's doing better stuff than, than ever. And and Sorel keeps going. There's things he does in the back of the book review. Jaffe's still doing it. Al Jaffe is like 95, yeah. 96, and he's still doing his, you know, his fold-outs. Uh, I just saw him the other day. He looks fabulous, you know. Arnie Roth is having a birthday party mm. in uh, in a couple of months. Oh, no, next month, yeah. So, you know, it's just something that, that is just, and I was thinking about it, you know, coming down here today, thinking about how, how really great this is because... If you don't do this, what are you going to think about? How many, you know, you, you're reading the obits. It's like Ross Chast's cartoon, you know, who died today. <laughs> then that's all you're worrying about, about how you're doing, uh, how what people are going to say about you at your funeral. It's, it's just running as fast as I can. Well, who's its actual page? The great uh, pitcher, who was very, uh, very old. He was pitching until he was 50, I think. And he said, you can't look back. Somebody may be gaining on you. And I think that's, uh, that's, that's what's so. So I, I just, you know... Don't think about that too much, but uh, try to get you know as much done as as, as, as possible. So this this book was a, a a great inspiration, a great impetus for me to do it. Uh, the show I'm still working on it with Marilyn, the curator. I'm just finishing finishing up another uh, children's book for Scholastic with uh, another colleague and a couple more humor books on the in the back of my mind and illustrate whatever I can do. You know, it's it's. Uh, Keeps me out of trouble and off the streets. <laughs> well, I'd probably like to be playing punch ball anyway, like I was doing in school. There you go. That was a great Mort Gerber. His new book, Mort Gerber on the Scene, is out now on Fanographics. Thanks to him and thanks to Fanographics for setting that up. Thanks to you guys for listening to the program. If you like the show, there are a number of ways to support us. You can rate and review us on iTunes, Google Podcasts, on Spotify and YouTube now. Like us on Facebook. If you have any feedback, it's rlcast at gmail.com. Follow us on Tumblr. That's rlcast at .tumblr.com. That is the first and best place to get all of our IYL related information. And that's about all we got for this week so stick around because we are going to be back and hopefully my voice will be back as well just about this time next week with another episode of RIYL.